Hi again, everybody. Uh, I'm Jamie Allison, and this is the Big Idea, Big Moves podcast. And um, this is the, the destination for high performers. Um, we talk to people from different niches, different kind of backgrounds, and, and with different experiences. And we really talk to them about um, things that we can translate into kind of our lives and, and their experiences uh, in, in getting to where they are. Um, uh, we uh, have a, a guest today that I, I know you're going to absolutely love. Um, she's got some fantastic experience, and uh, um, you know I, I think most of you will know her and, and will really want to hear some of the, the things that she's gone through the last little while and things that you can translate into your lives. Um, the uh, the first thing I, I do want to do is is like we've done in the last couple of um, uh, of podcast episodes is that um, we're going through kind of a very different time right now and just want to spend uh, a quick second thanking um, all of the the healthcare workers and uh, essential services people whether it's it's the truck drivers or the the restaurant workers that are still kind of getting food out for people um, any of those things that uh, we just want to make sure that uh, that we thank people for uh, for doing that for us and. And, uh, and remind everybody, let's do what we need to do to make sure that we keep them safe and uh, stay home right now. So, uh, so we do want to say that. The other one is, if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, one of our partners, um, Jazz HR, is is doing something from that support uh, standpoint too. Um, they have uh, recruiting software um, that's kind of a platform that helps um, businesses uh, be able to find people and track their their recruitment stuff, um, and they are providing that free to any essential services groups right now so um, so that, that can help them be able to, to staff right now and it can be difficult and uh, and also help them kind of get things moving um, uh, from the back end standpoint too so go to www.bigideabigmoves.com and you'll see a, a link there and you can go through and take a look at it whether you're an essential service or anybody else who's interested in it as well but definitely go on there and, and um, if you have the opportunity make sure you, you thank them and any of those businesses that are doing things right now to give back and, and uh, help out as well. Um, so today's guest, I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to have. She's a, a big inspiration to um, um, athletes and, and um, people outside of that realm. Um, she is um, an Olympic gold and silver medalist and in 2014 became the first woman to win both a Clarkson Cup and an Olympic gold medal in the same year, which is pretty cool. Um, you may know her from her appearances on uh, Amazing Race Canada. Um, most recently, uh, she had a stint on Battle of the Blades as well. Um, and she plays a really big role and, and was in that just uh, before she, uh, she kind of, uh, this, all this stuff happened is um, uh, there was a Dream Gap tour that she did a lot of work with as well. Um, she's a huge, strong voice for women's hockey and also girls in sport. And, and so we're gonna delve into a few of those things but um, first of all Natalie Spooner thank you very much for doing this and um, uh, you know we were talking just before we came on here how's uh, how are things doing kind of being kind of pent up in your house when when there were a lot of exciting things that could have been happening with you right now too yeah thanks so much for having me on I mean right now is really the time we're supposed to be at world championships and peaking and competing so uh, definitely a different kind of time um, you know just staying at home. I think the first few days it was relaxing and then it was like, what am I going to do now? I mean, I'm so used to being on the road and traveling and training. Um, so still getting my training in, but definitely finding a new normal and what life looks like now and finding a routine, um, you know, so that every day I wake up and feel that there's still purpose and meaningfulness to every day and, and making, you know, whether it's a difference in my hockey career or just a difference in maybe brightening someone's day. Yeah, I, I mean, it's funny, I, I did notice that, um, I mean, aside from what you're doing kind of at home to keep in shape and all of those things, but one thing you are kind of doing is is kind of doing a um, opening things up for people to interact with you. And uh, you're going to have uh, um, a, a session, I think, through Instagram, if I'm, uh, if I remember correctly, um, yeah. where people can kind of interact with you. Why don't you tell us a bit about that and what you're doing just while you're while you're sitting there. It's a great way to interact with some of your fans, too. Yeah, so um, starting next Monday, I'm going to start start it's called um my blue quarantine couch <laughs> hanging out there a lot yeah um but really just doing lots of different things this monday um probably start off with with a little baking once that goes in the oven then we'll transition into some questions uh also have my amazing race and teammate partner on uh, megan mickelson yeah i mean she's someone that i have looked up to to a long time and especially in the health and wellness field so definitely we'll yeah. get some insight from her get to talk a little hockey and a little 
little bit about Amazing Grace because I think that's always pretty intriguing yeah. to people. And then, yeah. um, you know, just have conversations and open it up to some questions and answers. And hopefully every Monday I can kind of switch it up. Um, you know, maybe battle the blades one week. Um, yeah. People, maybe I looked up to growing up. I think yeah. it'll just kind of cool to to share those experiences and um, you know everyone that's watching. Hopefully, they get to learn something and feel involved, but also for me to not feel so bored and yeah. <laughs> to um, you know help others, and they're also helping me by joining in too. Yeah, well, that's it's it's a good time to do that. You do realize how it's um, if you can't have the same kind of physical connection that way, at least there's a way of being able to do it and replicate it as much as you can. I think mm -hmm. right now, and and actually, it leads me into kind of the the first bit I wanted to talk to you about a little bit is that um, you're one of those um, people who have built a really good um, uh, personal brand, and and so that's part of it too. Is that you have done a, a you've transitioned um, yourself through kind of being that kind of hockey player to being kind of much more than that in in many ways because you have been able to get opportunity from some of the things you've done that way has that um has that been intentional for you like do you do you do that intentionally did it just become uh did it happen organically how did that work because you you're, you're known for the spooner selfie and all of those things as well now and and how did that happen over time yeah it just kind of happened i mean 2014 olympics like uh, that was my first olympics i didn't really know going into it but uh it was during that process that I actually was um, found out about Amazing Race and asked my teammate to be on it. And I think yeah. kind of after going on Amazing Race, like we were just going on for fun. Like our whole thing was let's not get kicked off first. <laughs> <laughs> that's first that's everybody's first goal, I think, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, but then after that, it just kind of, I mean, happened. And I think um, what's really special about getting these opportunities is yeah. a lot of people watch us play hockey and we have full cages on. They don't really get to see us or get to know our personality. So getting to go on something like Amazing Race, I'm now a real person. Um, you know, people can relate to me. I, I have a personality and I'm not just this intense hockey player that's out on the ice playing hockey. And I think that that was something, you know, that was also special to me, but also hopefully for everyone else getting to, you know, realize that everyone you're watching are real people. And it means a lot because when I was little and I watched the girls playing hockey, I mean, I just, I thought they were someone that I would never get to be like, or yeah. these gods. And then I got to meet Jennifer Botterill and get to, you know, interact yeah. with her and see her gold medals. And it was really that moment that I was like, wow, I could be that. Like, she's a real person. She's here. She, you know, she's just like anyone else. And I could become that. So I think to show our personalities and to show that we are just your girl next door, or, you yeah. know, we live in the same neighborhoods as you. Um, I think that that's something that's, uh, that's really important. Well, and, and how important is that even outside of uh, of sport? I mean, one of the things that um, you know it, it really translates into is that there's um, having that, especially for young girls, um, to have role models, whether it's in hockey or it could be in politics, it could be in leadership roles. You know, how important is that for for young girls to be able to see and project themselves into those roles? Yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing it a lot more now. There's there's women that are breaking down all these barriers, whether it's through sport, through work, um, that are getting these leadership positions. And I think it's really paving the way for a lot of girls now, even my age and, and hopefully the next generations to be able, it won't be something that's unheard of to have, yeah. to have jobs in those positions. Yeah. Uh, and I think that it's pretty amazing because you know what they say, like you, you can't dream it if you can't see it. So yeah. to have these women that are breaking these barriers and dreaming it without even seeing it um, is opening the doors for a lot of other young girls to be able to have those big dreams and to say them. And, and you know, I think when we were little, I said, oh, I want to play hockey. And people would be like, well, what else do you want to do? Like, you yeah. can't just play hockey. Yeah. Um, and so hopefully, you know, even when we get a women's professional hockey league, no one will question those girls when they say, I want to be a hockey player because it's going to just yeah. be a career. It's not going to just be a hobby for them. Now, before kind of all of this stuff happened, um, the Dream Gap Tour was kind of happening. And, and you were one of those players that played in the CWHL when it suddenly kind of it went yes. through what it went through. Um, maybe first, how, how did that feel as a player? Because, uh, you know, from my understanding, it, it there wasn't a whole lot of anything ahead of time. It was very sudden. And, um, you know, as a player who invests so much, and I think a lot of people who maybe don't know the uh, – the, the workings of the CWHL behind would know that, you know, the, the people playing in that league were exactly what you're talking about. were very interactive with, with the, the people who came to see them were, were, 
very much there for the passion because most of them, if not all of them, had some other thing they were doing, whether it was school, whether it was work, all of those things. And, and to have that taken away, it must have been pretty tough for players. Yeah, I mean, I think we felt like we had worked so hard to get to the point where we were. And we had probably the most successful Clarkson Cup final um, played at Rico Coliseum. I got to be on the broadcast, which was really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, two amazing teams, Calgary and Montreal. And we just felt like we were kind of on a roll. We had the all-star game at the ACC or at Scotiabank arena. Yeah. So it was really, I mean, taking off. And then we got to world championships after the season and it was right before world championships were going to start. Um, we were in Finland and we got a call saying that the league was folding um, and yeah. it wouldn't be in existence next year. So we were definitely blindsided and totally caught off guard because yeah. we thought we were on the right track. Um, but we had to then take a real hard look at, at women's hockey and what um, would be the next step and what we deserved as players and what we'd worked so hard for. Um, you know, it was time to take this stand and, and create the PWHPA and yeah. show that there is a market for women's hockey out there and people do want to watch it. Um, you know, it's just getting the word out there and making sure that people know, um, you know, we play every other year, not just the Olympic years. Yeah, yeah. And, and do you... Um... Uh, do you worry about this pause, I guess, in some ways? Because even with that tour, you were really generating some of that, um, you know, even even more excitement around it. And and you would have had additional hockey happening right now. It is, do you worry about that, about whether it might set things back a little bit? I mean, I think we created a lot of momentum with the Dream Gap Tour. And we got to go to some pretty amazing places that don't get to see women's hockey a lot. Yeah. I mean, we were in Arizona, Philly. Um, you know, that don't have a lot of women's teams there. So I think yeah. the momentum we created, it obviously would have been nice to even be able to take that into the world championships. And for people that have come to see us play in the Stream Gap Tour, get to and watch you, you know, on the world stage um, yeah. and see kind of both sides of it and, and how it goes. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's disappointing that hockey season got cut off and we don't get to continue this. But I know next season – hopefully now building off this, I think there's a lot more excitement around it and just to see how successful it was. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of the NHL team stepped up and kind of had us in their, in their hub. So hopefully next season there's more um, and we get to travel to some other places that, you know, get to see the men play, but not the women play all the time. And I think that that's, yeah that's something that's really cool. Well, and that's the thing is maybe there's that time period right now where you can kind of spend the time thinking through how to move that forward. And, and maybe there's, there's a little more traction you can get that way too. Um, one of the things is that um, you were involved in, um, uh, you know, more than one game, but I would say one in particular in the, the gold medal game that um, uh, in uh, Sochi that mm -hmm. is, is absolutely seen as, as a classic game. And I think both teams involved said that almost directly after the game because of, um, you know, I mean, you went from uh, come from behind victory um, mm -hmm. in overtime, all of those things. And, and it just kind of built into a, a real classic game. And, and I just wonder kind of what, um, um, what's it like to be part of something that is not just a regular game? I mean, that is part of, of, uh, especially in Canada, the sporting history and, um, and, and, you know, what's, what's it feel like to be part of like the thread and fabric of, of Canada now? Yeah. I mean, I think everyone remembers exactly where they were yeah. at the time that we were going to overtime. I mean, I've heard so many messages of people who were on vacation, finding TVs to watch it. Literally Canada just stood still to watch this game, which is pretty amazing. Um, I mean, it was the best moment of my life to, to win that yeah. gold medal. And that whole year, I think, was probably one of the best teams that I've ever been a part of, but also one of the hardest years yeah. of my hockey career. Yeah. I mean, uh, there was a lot that happened that year. We played, I mean, Midget AAA Boys League all around Alberta. We were losing a lot of games, which never happened in the past. Yeah. Um, we were on a four-game um, losing streak to the Americans going into the Olympics. We had our coach step down about – a month yeah. before the, the team was going to be named. So probably November when the Olympics were in February. So we had to really overcome a lot of adversity as a team that year. Um, our team slogan became unity in adversity because we really had to just come together as a team and be there for one another. You know, it wasn't going to be our coaches. It wasn't going to be anyone else that was going to make us successful. It was really going to be the team. Um, I think that it, it, all of that stuff we overcame, it really led us to, believe that we could come back from any deficit so even we yeah. were down you know we had the belief in ourselves that we could come back um and it really made us one of the best teams i've ever been a part of 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, that's one of the the pieces that I I think would be you know just amazing is the resiliency that was built through that process. And and it's mm-hmm. it's interesting. Do you think a lot of that came from the losses early on and all of the stuff that happened beforehand? Is is that where most of that came from for the team? For sure. I mean, I think you know we'd have so many down moments and um, had to overcome it. But at the same time, we knew we could come back against the U S because we had done it before. Um, We had two games early on where we beat them. And then obviously this four game losing streak, we got a new coach. We hadn't won with him until we actually went overseas. Um, And we won one exhibition game with him before going on a winning streak through the Olympics. So I think that our team did build a lot of resiliency. And I think um, we had a lot more hard moments the Sochi year than we did um, the Pyeongchang year and I'm not yeah. saying that that's the reasons but yeah. um, it, they were kind of totally flip-flop of years yeah. um, and you know I think I would take all those hard moments to then win an Olympic gold then to take no hard moments and and to come out you know losing yeah yeah well and and so you know a lot of people see kind of the end product of what happens in an Olympics so why don't you tell us uh, be, let's say two months out of before you're, you're actually flying to go where you need, what, mm-hmm. what does a, a day look like for Natalie Spooner getting ready for an Olympics? What, how is that different than what other people would kind of see? Like what, what are you doing to train? What kind of things do you, uh, you know, are you having to do? Yeah. So I'll start even before two months. Cause like Olympic yeah. year is totally something different. Um, in May, we have like a month long boot camp, which yep. is literally boot camp. Like we're up from seven to 7 PM training. You think it's going to be the hardest month of your life, but it's really not. It gets harder. Um, <laughs> you come back home. You're home for about two months. And then August, we all just pick up our lives and we all have to move to Calgary. So we just find like a condo or something to live in, in Calgary. And we train as a team um, from August all the way, well, all the way to the Olympics. But the team is yeah. main, named in December. So they take about 28 players, but you can get cut at any time along that road. So wow. it's the longest tryout you'll ever be a part of. Um, yeah. And you play a lot of games. I remember Sochi year, I think we had 55 games in five months, which was more than an NHL schedule packed into those five months. Five months. Um, plus you have, you know, your weightlifting on game days, your training, cause you got to try to fit it all in. Yeah. So we were definitely very worn down and a lot of injuries, but um, you know, you, you battle through it and uh, it's a very intense, um process I guess but yeah. also you know very rewarding in the end and I remember it was I think it was December 21st that we got called into the offices one by one and I remember Kevin Deneen who was our new yeah. coach once our other one stepped down and he um stood up and he said Spooner are you ready to do overseas and I just like burst into tears it was like <laughs> the best Christmas present ever so you're really you're getting either the best Christmas present or the worst Christmas present yeah. um, heading home yeah at Christmas. that's that, that's it's got to be fantastic for the people that get it it's probably yeah just absolutely heartbreaking for the person that doesn't get that as it gets close right it's yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's kind of a, a mixed emotion too because you've become such good friends with everyone on the team yeah. I mean you've been spending all this time together they're literally your sisters you spend every day together you even live with some of them so um it's a hard it's a hard few months because even they can get cut along the way and it's like you just lost your best friend yeah, um, you yeah. Know who the person you're leaning on to get through this like so yeah. it's yeah it can be wow. it can be pretty scary well and and so how do you um through this and and things like that how do you how do you kind of get through the stress yourself like what kind of things do you do personally to to try to get past that yeah I mean I think I just try to stay in the moment and not really look ahead to you know that December date or what to when the cuts are coming yeah. um and I think you know when you go into those big games that's pretty stressful too but you have to remember that you've played thousands of games in your life you know you're prepared for this like it's just another hockey game yeah there might be more people watching there might be more people in the crowd but it's just another game and you're gonna make great plays and you're gonna make some terrible plays but that's how the game goes and um you got to get over them quick and just you know play the game and and use your skills and be confident at the end of the day now you've always had a reputation of um, being pretty tenacious. I think, like you, um, you know how how you play is is that way from from what I think most people would say. And so does wow. that is that something that, yeah, <laughs> is that a learned thing for you, or is it a it's a is it innate? 
you know, that just that, yeah, that's just the way I play compared to like, cause some people it's, it's just different. Um, mm -hmm. but you very much are that kind of grind in the corner kind of player. So, um, you know, where does that come from? Yeah. I mean, growing up, I had three older brothers, so I think I was just always trying to keep up with them. And a lot of the time I think I was injuring them by accident, but, um, <laughs> I think my dad just always kind of instilled it. us like, you're, you got to work harder than everyone else. I also had, now I'm a very big player compared to everyone, but I yeah. had a late birthday growing up. So I was actually one of the smaller players at first uh, growing okay. up. So I think yeah. that also, you know, made me make sure that I, you know, was a good skater and try to skate faster than everyone and try to, you know, get in there and get the pucks, um, but yeah, I think it was just kind of a combination of everything. Um, my dad, he was a rugby player, so he kind of was, you know, there's, there's no pain ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, and then my brothers just trying to compete with them and keep up with them, I think definitely helped with that. Yeah. And, and they've been successful hockey players as well, right? So. Yeah, they're all done now, but yeah, they play yeah. men's league for yeah. fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> um uh, so we talked a little bit about some of the um the experiences of uh, you know of inequity at times whether it's from uh, um just in in kind of opportunities i think for girls and and for women um uh, maybe first of all i'll ask you know for for you growing up through hockey I, I don't know if it was a lot different at that time like i you you hear when you talk to like someone like Haley wickenheiser who has mm -hmm. had been in it for so long and was one of those first real trailblazer people um, I mean, the experiences that she had kind of growing up, a lot of it is what drove her is, is because, you know, she was relegated to having to get dressed in a broom closet somewhere all the time. That was actually, you know, that much worse. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, it's, it wasn't quite as, as much now because I know in girls hockey, it's, it's much better from that standpoint now. But, but were those things, did you have experiences like that? Or is it that some of those people that came before kind of changed that for you? I mean, I was pretty lucky, like, growing up in Toronto that yeah. there was a lot of girls teams around. I played boys hockey for one year, and then I actually quit hockey because I didn't like it. Yeah. Um, but I still went to power skating, and eventually I met another girl at power skating, uh, and then she invited me to join her girls team. So I think that that's kind of how I got into girls hockey, and I stuck with it all the way up. I definitely had a lot more fun um, with the girls. Yeah. And, I mean, the only time I really had to, like, get dressed in broom closets was hockey <laughs> school. Um, yeah. But my brothers were also always there with me. Um, either they were coaching at the hockey schools or um, going on with me. So it didn't seem like it was something different. I just thought it was normal that I had to get ready in, in the broom closet, which yeah. now, or, you know, in the, in the restroom or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, wow. It just seemed like what I had to do. And yeah. I was, I was fine with it because I was getting to go play hockey. Yeah, so. that's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, you, you take with it and, and probably, um, well, and you think of the, since that time, even in the last little while, how much um, uh, has been built up in, in girls league hockey, which is probably a lot due to what you and others have done to, to increase the profile too. Yeah, I mean, girls hockey is growing so fast that now if you went to hockey school, there'd be so many girls there. And yeah. I mean, I even run a hockey school that, I mean, it's for girls, boys are welcome, but really only girls show up. Yeah. So um, I think that it's amazing now that there is all girl camps that, you know, some camps that are just regular have more girls than boys. Um, so they definitely got a locker room now. Yeah. Um, I think that, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Like just how fast it's growing and how fast it's still growing. I think, you know, boys hockey is kind of plateaued and girls yeah. hockey is just still on the rise. Still and on the rise. It's yeah. Exciting. No. There's so much talent coming up and I think it's only going to keep getting better. Yeah. Well, and you see that in the, um, the, the competition level that you see in every country right now too. And, and it's nice to see that it's, it's kind of being built from bottom up too. So, um, and, and the other part is that um, you do a lot of work in, um, you know, in girl in sport and making sure that you help girls stay in sport and things like that. What are, what are some of the things that you'd say is, um, are, are really important to do to make sure that girls not only have opportunity in sport, but want to stay in sport. I, I mean, that's one of the things that has been a challenge a lot of the time is that, um, is if the focus isn't correct, then you sometimes lose girls out of sport earlier than, than some boys. So how, how would you see that? Yeah. I mean, I got to do a lot of work with fast and female. That's even just mm -hmm. opening girls eyes to lots of different sports. And I think that's the first thing is, you know, let them try out all different sports until they find one that they love. Uh, I mean, I did dance, I did gymnastics, I did soccer, I did hockey, I did badminton, whatever it is, like there's going to be one that you love and that you're willing to stick with. And I think the other thing is um, 
we're finding a lot of girls drop out of sports once they hit puberty. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that it's really about changing the narrative and a lot of people worry about, Oh, I'm getting big muscles and it's, it's not attractive, but I think society is changing now and that's becoming yeah. acceptable. And that's, you know, it, it shouldn't even be a question about having muscles. It should be, you know, I'm strong and I'm healthy and, um, this is the body that's going to do the work for me to be successful at my sport that I chose. Uh, and I think that that, that was something that a lot of girls were dropping out a sport from. So I think it's really at that critical time is, you know, yeah. whether, whether it's between 10 and 13, um, the girls are then starting to think, um, you know, about body types, about friends, about everything else going on in life. And I think yeah. that it's then that they need to have those role models and to see female athletes, um, who have, you know, continued playing sports and, um, that fast and female puts on a lot of events like that. And, um, yeah. I've been lucky to go to some and just to meet the girls and for them to try out all these different sports. And, um, yeah. I think the more that moms and dads can get their daughters out to see, um, women playing sports, um, yeah. the more likely they will be to stay, to stay in it. Yeah. It's interesting when you talk about kind of, um, you know, uh, people being worried about having muscles and being strong and and you do see that narrative changing a lot and you see things like um crossfit and functional fitness and some of those things where you know you you are starting to see um role models that come up through that kind of way as well which which does kind of focus on that strong female not just kind of physically but mentally as well which i i think i think is a, a really cool thing to see for role modeling for young girls Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I get to play with Carolyn Prevo. She played on the Toronto Furies yeah. with me. And she was, I think, ranked 11th at the CrossFit Games and yeah. top Canadian women. And, like, she is just amazing at what she does. Like, I look up to her in the gym because I'm like, there's no way I could do any of that. <laughs> yeah. Like, she could blow so many people out of the water with just <laughs> and just how well she moves. Um, it's, it's, like, amazing to watch her do her, do her thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and so, you know, one of the things that uh, that you're known for is um, is that you still have a lot of fun while you're doing all this stuff, um, mm -hmm. and people gravitate towards you, I think, because you have fun. So, um, you know, I, I think there's there's sometimes where people take things way too seriously. It's you can take things seriously, but you also need to be able to have that fun component. So, how how do you how do you inject that when you've got um, you know, especially I think in in some higher levels of hockey where it is very intense and it is you know something where there's an there's an end goal that everybody wants. But how do you inject the fun part into it? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot of different ways. Obviously, I mean, there's times when you have to be serious and times when you can have fun. And I think a lot of my fun comes back to getting to go on the ice with little girls now and just seeing how yeah. much fun they have. And it really takes me back to those moments where it was like, hockey is a game and I should be having fun out here. Um, you know, so I think that that's a lot of it. Um, other things are, I mean, a team, when you have a team, there's a whole bunch of different personalities and you're going to have people that are way more serious, people that are pretty chill, people that are upbeat, people that are fun. And I think it's really all those different personalities that make up a great team. And I remember 2014 Olympics, I got to play on a line with Haley Wickenheiser and Megan Augusta. And if anyone knows Haley, she is pretty intense. <laughs> She's intense. <laughs> um, so people probably would have thought like, do not put them together. But we got along so well. And every time that, you know, Haley got a little bit worked up, a little bit too intense, you know, maybe it was just like cracked a joke or um, gave her a smile and it kind of just, you know, made everything fine. So I think that there's kind of that, that balance of finding um, in a team that who's going to work well together and, and how do you bring all those different personalities together to, to make it um, one team that can all work together really, really well. Yeah, I think that's kind of a message that can go beyond hockey. I mean, I, we work with a lot of organizations and, and, you know, when you talk to leaders, it's, it's always don't just hire yourself over and over again, because if you have the same type of person, if you're all, um, you know, a, a group of, of one similar type of person, you're not going to probably get the most out of your team because the, mm -hmm. it, having more diversity and more diversity of thought is actually, um, you know, it gives you better outcomes at the end of it. And, and you know, and, and I think a, a team like yours is, is probably a, a great microcosm of what can happen in, you know, large organizations or countries mm -hmm. or whatever it happens to be. It's the same kind of concept, right? Yeah. And it's finding that, you know, that mutual respect of what is everyone bringing to the table and, you know, maybe not judging them for being different, but 
um, appreciating their differences because you know that they're bringing something totally different than what you could bring yeah. um, to the team and, uh, you know, just appreciating everyone's differences that's going to make up an amazing team. Yeah, very cool. Um, so one of the things that we, we ask every guest to do is, um, it, and, and we'll probably take it from the standpoint of if you um, are a parent of, of a young girl, let's say, but young, uh, a, a parent generally, because it's really the same thing, um, but a young girl maybe in particular, is if you wanted to make sure that they not only got kind of as much opportunity as possible to do things in sport, um, but also kind of was able to keep that love of sport. What would be kind of two things you'd say would be really important for that parent to consider? Okay. Oh, first That's I think would be to uh, expose them to sport. I think um, to bring them out to female sports, there's so many, I mean, you could go watch soccer, hockey. I mean, there's even ultimate Frisbee. There's so many different female sports out there that, um, you could find on any given day. So yep. definitely expose them to female sports and to see, um, you know, that they can have role models. And there's a lot of amazing women out there who do so many different things. And, you know, we don't get to always hear their stories, but um, if you get up to the games, you'll get to meet them. Yeah. And then the second one, um, I think let them play all different sports is another important one. Um, I, I know now, especially in hockey, people are really hyper focusing on hockey and having yeah. them play year round. But I think it's really important um, to be a good all around athlete, and I think not get burnt out on one sport. Yeah. Um, you know, and and I think as a parent, you also have to realize like your player, your daughter or son might not be the next, you know, Sidney Crosby or right. or Mary Philippe Poulain. Like they might just love the game and want to just go out there and have fun. And you have to realize that they're learning a lot of critical things that are going to make them a better person down the road. I mean, they're going to learn about teamwork, work ethic, and they're going to be able to bring that over into a job later on in life. If, even if they're not, you know, their career is not going to be hockey. It, it's going to, um, set them up for something um, that they're going to love down the road. So I think just realizing all those things and letting them go and have fun. I think at the end of the day, it is a sport. It's a game and let them have fun and run with it. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Natalie. Thank you very much for taking the time today. Lots of really cool stuff that, uh, that we talked about. And uh, um, I mean, maybe um, do you want to just let us know, um, you know, Instagram, how, uh, if people want to follow you and want to kind of take a look into your um, coaching school, any of those things, what, what would you throw out there? Yeah. Um, my Instagram is at Nat Spooner five, same as my Twitter. And you can find all the information about my hockey school for girls. Um, it's ages five to 13. And yeah, everything that I'm getting up to in this quarantine life, yeah. you can also find on there. Yeah. And what, and which days can they, uh, can they go on to your uh, quarantine couch piece? Yes. Which it's, It'll be at noon on Mondays, um, Eastern standard time. So I'm awesome. in Toronto and yeah, follow cool. along. All right. Well, thanks very much. And um, uh, for anybody at home, make sure you follow those things and, uh, and follow Natalie's story as she goes along. Once we get out of some of this stuff right now, you'll be able to um, hopefully watch her uh, playing for Team Canada again in, in the near future. So, um, so thanks to Natalie. A um, couple of quick things, just if, um, uh, if you want to be able to, like if you're spending this time um, at home and, and trying to uh, look at planning out your life, planning out other things um, that you want to do over the next little while, um, um, there is a, a cool form to help you do that if you want to on um, on the uh, website, which is uh, again www.bigideabigmoves.com, um, and we have kind of an overview that was used kind of at the start of the year was more of a you know plan out some of your health and wellness and your um, business and and all of those different components, family, and a lot of people we've had um, kind of writing in lately or have been following have been talking about having all this time um, kind of with loved ones and and doing different things and spending the time to reflect they're thinking that those things are going to change so uh, uh, it's just a nice tool to be able to use and so if you're interested in it make sure that you uh, go on there and do that um, keep watching because we have more guests um, we we really take pride in having really cool high level guests on this show um, we've got a few lined up for the next little while so um, so after you listen to Natalie um, keep uh, make sure you hit the subscribe button keep uh, connected with us and every time we have a new episode you'll have the first crack at being able to listen but again um, thanks very much for listening and we'll see you next time on big idea big moves <laughs>